I'm super excited to be here and I'm very grateful. I appreciate the invitation from Anne and Kathleen and Ariel to be here and I'm honored to be speaking to a group of such wonderful individuals. Um, like Anne said, I met her last year at the MPN and Women Conference in Chicago. I attended as a patient because like Anne said, I was diagnosed with polycythemia vera um, about nine years ago. And uh, we hit it off and here I am today to help maybe sort out some of the of the confusion about uh, sexual health and intimacy as it pertains to MPN patients. So um, if you have any questions, please stop me or feel free to ask. This can be a very casual discussion. Okay, so I have nothing financial to disclose. Um, if I talk about any particular product or procedure today, um, I'm not financially linked to them at all. So sexual health. Sexual health is it's a very important part of our identity as adults. And it really can truly directly affect our self-esteem and our happiness. And when our sexual health becomes dysfunctional, that can negatively impact our quality of life, especially as it pertains to us as uh, cancer survivors. So there is a growing population of cancer survivors around the world. In 2016, the number of survivors was estimated to be roughly 15 and a half million. And because of the aging population and the advancements in cancer treatments and early detection, that number is expected to reach roughly 26 million by the year 2040. So survivorship is important and there's lots of issues that we as cancer patients uh, have to deal with. And so it's important that we as physicians um, address these issues in a comprehensive way. I think there's this misconception that as we get older, sexual health is not as important as it was when we were younger. And um, that's just tr basically not true. There was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007, and it looked at 3,000 US adults, and their ages were 57 to 85. And they found that the majority of, of these adults engage in intimate relationships and they regard sexuality as an important part of their life. And as a gynecologist, I see this over and over that it is truly very important no matter what age, and it is something that we must um, address. So let's talk about it, right? If it's a problem that's affecting that many people, let's talk about it. Well, unfortunately, um, there's a disconnect between um, us physicians and patients in terms of addressing sexual health. And there was a study, again, in 2007 that showed that 74% of uh, long-term cancer survivors believe that physicians should regularly ask uh, about sexual issues. But um, unfortunately, that 64% of us physicians never initiate that conversation during, uh, during the care. So there's a, a disconnect. And I think the problem lies in the fact that it, um, there can be time constraints, obviously, in, in, in a visit. And um, there was a, a study that looked at gynecologic oncologists, so oncologists that take care, strictly take care of female cancer patients. And less than half of gynecologic oncologists take a sexual history uh, among their new patients. And 80% of these physicians stated that the reason why was that there, there was insufficient time to do so. So I, I bring this up because it does truly take a team to provide comprehensive care. So, Oncologists are very busy. They have a lot of information to go over with patients and a lot of information to kind of sort out. So the sexual part of that may fall onto us gynecologists or primary care physicians. So I, I encourage all of you women that, are, that have an MPN to have a very close and um, successful working relationship with your gynecologist so that you feel comfortable enough to bring up these issues. If you don't have a gynecologist in your area, find a primary care physician who's well-versed in women's health, so that way your needs are being met. But it does truly take a collaborative effort between we as gynecologists, oncologists, primary care physicians, uh, so that way we're not overlooking these important topics. So if we're talking about female sexual dysfunction, what exactly is it? What does that mean? Well, there's four components. One of them is an inhibited sexual desire or decreased libido. This is probably one of the most common symptoms that I hear as a gynecologist. 
many, many patients a week will tell me that they just don't have a sex drive anymore, or their sex drive is, is significantly diminished. Inability to become aroused, delayed or absent orgasm, which is also called anorgasmia. And then the last part of this component is painful intercourse, also called dyspareunia. Painful intercourse is uh, probably the second most common symptom that I hear among women with sexual dysfunction, especially because I take care of a lot of menopausal women and that can be uh, prohibitive for us in menopause if, if intercourse is painful. And we're gonna talk about some ways to help alleviate that. So our very own Dr. Ruben Mesa did, uh, was part of a study, the MPN Quality of Life International Study Group. Uh, and that study reported that two thirds of patients, 64% of patients with MPNs, have some degree of sexual dysfunction. So that's a very significant number of us that have sexual dysfunction among the MPN population. And 43% reported that their sexual dysfunction symptoms were severe. So this study included uh, over 1,900 patients. Um, you can see the breakdown. There were over 800 with ET, 600 and some with PV, 450-ish with MF, and six other. 52% of the patients in the study were 60 years of age and older, and 53% were female. And what the study looked at is that it asked those of us with an MPN to rate the symptom burden as it pertains to sexual dysfunction, rate the symptoms on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no symptoms and 10 being severe. And what they found was that the overall symptom score was 3.6, which the authors in this study categorized as a moderately high symptom burden. Almost 11% rated their symptoms as being severe, 10 out of 10. That's a lot of, 11% to me is a lot. So they broke it down further. Patients with MF had the most problematic sexuality scores, followed by those of us with PV, and lastly, those with ET. They looked at it a little bit more deeply and found that laboratory abnormalities played a role in symptom scores as well. So those patients that were transfusion dependent had the most significant impact on their sexual health, followed by those patients that were anemic, followed by those patients that were thrombocytopenic or low platelets, and then patients with a low white count um, were at the bottom of the list, less, less symptomatic. And then lastly, they looked at treatment and how, do, how does treating an MPN affect our sexual health? They found, and this, this graph is inverted compared to the other ones, so I apologize, but patients that were steroid dependent had, had a greater impact on their sexual health uh, in terms of dysfunction than patients who were on immunomodulators like thalidomide or lenalidomide. And then those patients on interferon had the least interference with their sexual health. And part of this, when I was putting this talk together, when I read this information that came out in December of 2018, talking about chronic pain in MPN patients, to me this made, makes sense as why also we may be affected uh, as it pertains to uh, our sexual health, because more than half of patients with MPNs report feeling pain related to the diagnosis. So most commonly, 53.2% of us with an MPN report chronic abdominal pain, and 48% of us report chronic bone pain. So if we're living with chronic pain, that is a negative deterrent, obviously, as it pertains to us wanting to be sexually active, because pain affects us, obviously, in a number of ways. But if we look at factors in general, not just among MPN patients, but what factors affect us women um, in terms of our level of interest in sex, what are the things that, that affect our libido? Bladder control problems. Obviously, if we're in inco incontinence, urinary incontinence is a, is a common problem among females, especially in menopause. If we're incontinent during intercourse or during um, intimate um, activities, then obviously that's going to make us avoid that. Uh, menopause and hormonal changes, we're gonna talk more about that because again, when, our, when we lose our hormones in menopause, that significantly affects our libido or our interest in sex. And unfortunately, we as MPN patients aren't always the best candidates for hormone replacement therapy, and we're gonna touch on that, what we can use as alternatives. 
Sleep disturbance in general, so uh, the less sleep we have, the more fatigued we are, and that affects our libido. And again, a lot of us MPN patients have pretty significant sleep disturbance. We may be up half the night with night sweats. We may not sleep well because of chronic pain. Uh, depression or anxiety plays a role in our libido, especially because the treatment of these two entities, the medications, especially SSRIs, can negatively affect our libido. Stress in general, medications, there are lots of medications that can affect our uh, desire to, to be intimate. And health concerns in general, when we're living with a chronic health disease or a chronic health problem that wears on our mind and again may distract us or detract our libido. And when I put this list together, I realized that most of the things on this list are particularly pertinent to those with an, of us with an MPN. We don't sleep well. We may be depressed or anxious because we're scared about the disease that we have. Of course, we're gonna be stressed. There's lots to deal with. It's an emotional burden having this disease. Most of us are on medications. Most of us with an MPN or a lot of us with an MPN are on medications. And obviously, it, MPN, having an MPN is a health concern. So we are a perfect setup as women with MPNs to have sexual dysfunction. Okay, I talked about menopause. 80% uh, of women reported some decline in sexual desire during menopause. That's a lot. And 84% of menopausal women stated, though, that maintaining an active sex life is important. Uh, and this was a study out of the uh, out of 2013 British OBGYN journal. So how do we treat it? If sexual dysfunction is so prevalent among all women, especially those of us with an MPN, how do we fix it? Well, the most important thing that I think is just providing education. And this is why I think those visits where the majority of physicians don't bring up sexual dysfunctions because education, no matter what specialty you're in, takes time. And that's an important component of that patient-physician relationship is how we teach our patients. So sometimes I'll just sit and talk to patients about human anatomy or the sex, normal sexual function. I think a lot of women are under the misconception that the only, you know, vaginal intercourse is the only way to have an orgasm. Sometimes it's just teaching patients about anatomy and that, and that clitoral stimulation is important for orgasm. Sometimes it's talking about the normal effects of aging. What happens to our bodies when we go through menopause? What happens to our vaginas? Why do they get dry? Why does sex hurt? So sometimes it's just a matter of spending some time and explaining all of these things. I have an integrative health practice in my gynecology uh, practice, meaning I talk to a lot of patients about lifestyle medicine. We talk about exercise. We talk about nutrition. We talk about stress reduction. And so it is important to encourage your patients to maintain an active, uh, you know, to be active, physically active, because exercise is important for sexual health. Limiting alcohol is important. And we talk about just scheduling, having our patients schedule date nights with their partners, just setting some time aside for the two of them to be alone, to reconnect. We talk about enhancing stimulation. This can be a little touchy depending on the patient's level of comfort in talking about this, but we talk about maybe using vibrators or self-stimulation to help with some of the sexual dysfunction. Providing distraction techniques is important because sometimes it just requires using, playing that, the music that puts you in the mood, fantasizing during uh, you know, sexual activities. Meditation is huge and we're gonna talk about mindfulness-based therapy because meditation can help with stress reduction. We encourage non-coital behavior, so making sure that patients spend enough time with their partners. Massage, foreplay, I think unfortunately most couples kind of dive right into sex, but 10 to 15 minutes at least of foreplay, if not longer, is important, especially in our menopausal patients and patients with MPNs who may not be on hormone therapy because that, is, that time is critical to for vaginal lubrication, improving the blood flow to the genital region. Uh, minimizing pain with intercourse. This is a big one, and this is where I spend the majority of my time with our menopausal patients, because pain is usually the number one deterrent for intercourse. And we talk about how, how we do that and in the next two slides. I'm gonna go over some ways that can help. 
And then uh, we use any appropriate medication that we can to help with, with sexual dysfunction. So I mentioned meditation. I'm a firm believer in mindfulness-based therapy because I think it truly can help with stress reduction. And I teach a lot of my patients just how to do basic mindfulness, how to breathe. Um, I was, I, in 2011, in fact, right when I was diagnosed, I was finishing a two-year training with Dr. Andrew Weil at the University of Arizona, and he taught me a lot about mindfulness and how to teach patients how to breathe and reduce stress. So there was a review that, in the literature that showed that mindfulness-based therapy works to improve sex drive in women. And it also, re it, basically, because I think it's reducing our stress and it's helping us be present and in the moment, which I think is, which I think is huge. So I talked about minimizing pain with intercourse. 55% of women with painful intercourse, that's called dyspareunia, rate their symptoms as moderate to severe. So when, when we as women have pain with intercourse, unfortunately it can be severe and it can prevent us from, again, wanting to be sexually intimate with our partners. 64% of menopausal women uh, will report having pain with intercourse. And that is basically because when we lose our hormones in menopause, the vagina, estrogen is very important for vaginal health. And when we don't have estrogen anymore, we have very little, our vaginas become very dry, they thin out, they crack, they burn, they itch, the worst case scenario. And so unfortunately, unless we address this issue, intercourse becomes almost impossible. So how do we fix it? How do we get rid of pain with intercourse? It can be as basic as just talking about using a very good vaginal lubricant or moisturizer. Um, there's hundreds of these on the market. Patients have no idea which ones to get. And so I always encourage patients, if they can, to get one that's organic because you don't want to be putting more chemicals in your body. You don't want parabens and phthalates uh, in our body. So for water-based lubricants, Isabel Fay and Sliquid Organics are my favorite. Uh, if patients like more silicone-based lubricants, Penchant Premium makes a good one as well. I have a lot of patients who seek me out because of my integrative training, and so they want all plant-based options. And so there's a plant-based uh, lubricant that's made from aloe vera and vitamin E, and that's called aloe cadabra, which is very nice. And then sometimes I just tell patients if they don't have the funds or access to some of these, I say get a jar of inexpensive organic coconut oil. You can use it as a vaginal moisturizer. It can be a lubricant for intercourse as long as you're not allergic to coconut. Uh, you can also use vitamin E oil as well. Unfortunately, vaginal lubricants and vaginal moisturizers sometimes aren't enough and there can still be an element of pain. So then we move into hormones. I'm not per a proponent of systemic hormone replacement therapy for MPN patients because of our, we're already at a higher risk of, of blood clots and strokes. So um, I went through menopause early surgically before I was diagnosed with my MPN and, and um, I thought, oh, no big deal, I'll just go on hormone replacement therapy, which I did until I was diagnosed with my MPN and then I went off my hormones, which I believe, again, it's a touchy subject, but I, I try to avoid hormone replacement systemically uh, in myself and in my MPN patients. But vaginal estrogen is incredibly effective at getting rid of pain with intercourse, and it's safe for the most part in those of us with an MPN because there's been multiple studies that show that the amount of systemic absorption of estrogen into our bloodstream when we use it vaginally is minimal. So we it does not increase our risk of stroke and blood clots. So there's different forms of vaginal estrogen. You can use a cream, a tablet, a ring, um, and it's really just a matter of patient preference. There's also a newer product um, that's vaginal DHEA, which is a brand name Intrarosa, and that's a vaginal suppository that, uh, D, uh, that's made up of a hormone called DHEA. DHEA can convert to estrogen and or testosterone. And the, a lot of oncologists feel more comfortable with this one as well, just because, again, it's a minimal absorption of, of hormone into the bloodstream. So these are things, as an MPN patient, you can ask your gynecologist, start the discussion, uh, so that way you can um, get some relief. This is a, a treatment that I've used in hundreds of patients. It's called Mona Lisa Touch. It's a laser therapy, actually, for vaginal pain and dryness. Uh, it's FDA cleared for gynecologic use. Um, and what it does is it's a, it's a carbon dioxide laser treatment that's 
used vaginally. It's similar to the carbon dioxide lasers that plastic surgeons have used for years for, uh, to improve collagen, elasticity, moisture of the tissues. And so they just harnessed this energy and now we're using, we're using it vaginally. Uh, it has been a game changer for my cancer patients, especially my breast cancer patients who typically cannot even use vaginal estrogen. So it's a pretty successful treatment. It's, it's painless, it's done in the doctor's office. It's usually a series of three treatments. And uh, it basically brings the tissues back to the way they were before menopause. So it's, it's really a nice tool to have, especially for patients who um, are suffering with, with pain. So as I leave you here today, I just wanna let you know that there's multiple ways to make sex better. I believe it's truly just a matter of communicating. Communicating with your doctor, communicating with your partner, communicating with yourself, um, eat well, always, exercise regularly, uh, get enough rest, because everything is easier and, and more enjoyable when we're rested, um, adapt, be playful, uh, realize that, that sex is not gonna be the way it's, it used to be, and that's okay. You know, Sex isn't gonna be the way it was when we were in our 20s and 30s. Uh, but that's okay, it may even be better. So adapt, uh, there's always a way to make intercourse, uh, to make better sex. So thank you. Thank you.